Okay, well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming out uh, to attend the webinar. This is the second week in a four-part series on Christian leadership in a post-pandemic world. Uh, last week, we talked about how to reopen in the church. Everything about the Christian faith seems to be in close proximity to each other. And so we talked with the pastor of a mega church here in Florida, a medium-sized church and a small church. Uh, that video can be found online at covidchurcha.org covidchurchaid.org, um, or you can find it streaming on our Facebook Live page. Uh, today, however, we're very pleased to bring to you uh, basically reopening Florida and the economy. Um, this is uh, the issue of our day. Um, you know, the scripture says that uh, if a man can't uh, work, he doesn't eat, and that if you uh, don't provide for your own family, that you're worse than an unbeliever. So that's a pretty big deal to not be able to function properly. And so we want to talk about how we're going to reopen Florida. Uh, and we're very pleased to have our panelists with us that are going to discuss that. So if you're here with us, go ahead in the Q&A as you hear uh, the participant panelists talking, go ahead and uh, give a question if you'd like. And we're going to try to take the questions in real time um, as each topic is talked about. Um, we're going to be about a 60, 60 to 90 minute uh, program here. Some, some panelists may have to leave early, uh, but we're going to go ahead and just uh, start uh, and, and then go from there. So please uh, participate by giving a question and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. So let me do this. Uh, first, let's uh, have each of the panelists, why don't you just take a second, introduce yourself uh, to the webinar participants, uh, talk about what your responsibilities are publicly. And then um, if you would just give us a personal glimpse uh, into your personal life in terms of how this has impacted you at home. And then we'll go from there. Uh, and let's start with uh, my good friend, uh, Speaker designate uh, Chris Sprouse, um, who is a state representative in the Florida House. Well, thank you, John. It's great, great to be with you all, and great to be with the other panelists and the folks listening. You know, it, uh, as as you mentioned, I represent uh, North Pinellas County in the state legislature. Uh, have have done so for five years. Spent some time with you, John, on the on the Constitutional Revision Commission. Uh, so, you know, chaired House Judiciary in the past, and I, I currently chair, you know, House Rules Committee. You know, as far as the personal look, uh, certainly, you know, this is not what we probably expected life would look like, uh, certainly several months ago. And, uh, you know, our day, uh, you know, you noticed this morning, John, I, I kind of signed on just, just in the nick of time uh, to be here on time. And part of that's because, you know, certainly childcare has become a bit of an issue. We, we're, we're very blessed in that our, our mothers are very engaged with our children uh, during the day. But personal life in terms of how that, that is, uh, you know, that has changed, uh, you know, because of, you know, because of their age, we've obviously engaged in some, you know, some different kinds of social distancing that we didn't anticipate. Uh, I'd usually block off the morning, John, to be a preschool teacher. I got two little boys, uh, you know, three and four years old. So um, I have this, uh, not that I didn't respect preschool teachers before, but now I really, uh, I really understand what they're, what they're up against. And, um, but it's, uh, it's obviously been, you know, an opportunity to learn about, you know, what my kids are learning about and engage directly with their education. But, but certainly something, you know, we're, we're very, very blessed, but, uh, but life has been a little bit, you know, a little different uh, than it was before. It's great to be with y'all. Great. Uh, Mayor Bill Mutz. Um, I'm Mayor of Lakeland, Florida, and um, also uh, have the privilege of uh, being involved with Florida Family Policy Council over the years on the board's side, which has been a privilege uh, for me. Um, we had not anticipated having to encounter a problem like this, obviously, like the rest of the state and country and world. But I think for us, one of the things that has been really uh, sentinel is to watch the response of the private sector alongside our city, alongside our healthcare system, work together to solve problems so adeptly. And so we have had to uh, restructure many of the things that we've done and to make sure that we're protect protecting life first and the economy second. Uh, but obviously, um, as um, you know, Mr. Sprawls just said, we have to get back on deck economically in order to provide. And um, so I am in a let's crawl before you walk, before you run advocate and we're in crawl stage and so um, it's important. It, pre pre it, pre it creates limitations for all of us. I had a grandchild born uh, in this period of time that I could only look at through a window, you know, and that was our 24th, by the way, which is 
pretty exciting, and um, which I now held because I sufficed the parents over a period of time that we were safe. And uh, but that's a story, and there's thousands of those stories. I think about Mother's Day weekend. This would be probably the number one Mother's Day uh, childless weekend we have probably spent. So it's a great time to make sure we're using FaceTime and all the other opportunities to tell moms how much they're loved. Great. Thank you, Bill. And now the Chancellor of Education, uh, Eric Call from Tallahassee. Hi, good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you. And again, uh, my name is Eric Call, and I serve as the Senior Chancellor here at the Florida Department of Education. And my areas of responsibility uh, really range everything from our Office of Early Learning uh, with our youngest learners in the state, uh, with our K-12 uh, education system, our post-secondary system with career and adult education and our state college system, uh, vocational rehabilitation, blind services, in our Office of Safe Schools and articulation. So I have the blessing and kind of the fortune of being able to work with, you know, all aspects of education here in the state. And, uh, you know, as a former educator, started my career as a teacher, um, grew up in Pasco County, just, you know, north of speaker designate Sprawls there and uh, a proud USF graduate. And just, uh, again, really glad and appreciate the opportunity to kind of serve, you know, not only our state, uh, which is, you know, recognized nationally for having one of the, you know, one of the best, if not the best education system in all aspects in our country and have unbelievable educators and school leaders out there that are dedicated, not on a day in and day out basis and what they were doing before COVID, but even now in this period of time, how they have stepped up to really be agile and persevere in support of our students and our learners all across the spectrum. So look forward to spending some more time on that. And I would just tell you personally, as someone who has spent, um, majority of his career and time here in Florida and all of my family's here in Florida. Parents are both educators. My wife is a school social worker, uh, two kids um, that uh, uh, again, like all families around the state are learning what it means to have that balance between being both an educator and a parent. Um, just really, again, appreciate the opportunity to be with you today and be a part of this conversation and look at what we do to uh, go into the next steps of getting Florida, you know, reopened economically while uh, doing the things that we know are important for all of our citizens here in the state. So just appreciate it getting to be here. Thank you, Eric, for being with us. And we have about 30% of the callers uh, from the registration that are pastors. And so I'd like to introduce our director of pastoral ministries, Kevin Baird, and ask him to say a couple of words. He's going to be fielding the questions as they come in and feeding them uh, to the guest panelists. Kevin. Yeah. Thank you, John. It's great to be with everybody. My name is Kevin Baird. I have been a pastor for over 35 years. Um, have recently come on board with the Florida Family Policy Council as the Director of Pastoral Ministries, primarily uh, being an outreach director to uh, churches and pastors, uh, in a lot of ways trying to connect them with their civic leaders to both partner and to engage the civic arena and uh, to bring the church's influence into that sphere as well. And uh, we found ourselves incredibly busy in this uh, pandemic time period. We've been scrambling to do our best to help churches and pastors understand how to uh, reopen, how to do it wisely, uh, and all the issues that have surrounded it. So I've, I've been on point uh, with regards to that and uh, appreciate working with John and all of uh, his efforts and endeavor in this regard. So I'll be the quiet one today, which is unusual for me, and I'll just be fielding questions. So I want to encourage everybody, if you have a question, go ahead and punch in with that. And we'll try to group them together and make sure our panelists can answer those questions. Thank you. Great. Uh, so Representative Sprouls, let's start uh, with you. You are on the governor's task force to reopen Florida. Um, and I know, Eric, you have actually advised members of the task force and, and gave briefings. So let's talk first about what are some of the assumptions uh, that were made? How did, how did, what were some of the big picture ideas when you started the process and how you went about thinking about how we're going to do this? Yeah, I think I think one of the biggest, you know, the biggest credits I can give the governor and I think the people who are on the task force is to say, John, that there really weren't any assumptions. You know, I, I don't think that, you know, we they approached it with kind of the the end in mind. You know, a lot of times, you know, John, in, in politics, people start with the end and then work try to work their way backwards, uh, which usually doesn't end up with a great result. I think the way that they you know they approached the task force was to say, let's take nothing for granted. Uh, let's have a, a real conversation based on data. You know, let's let's figure out what that looks like from a health and economy perspective. And I'm sure a lot of people on that task force also did what I did, John, and what you and I would do on the CRC and other times, which is, you know, you don't just wait to hear the information on the call or in the meeting. You know, you go out and you find your own information, right? You do your own research. 
Um, I spent hours on the phone with, you know, the experts in John Hopkins in Baltimore and Shans, you know, those folks who weren't necessarily on the call, but I wanted to see if things kind of jive together. So I really think it was a ground up approach as, a, as opposed to a top down approach um, to come up with, you know, what the, the recommendations would be for the task force. I think that's, you know, the governor came out with a really measured approach. Some are going to say, hey, it could have been more aggressive. Some are going to say it should have been less aggressive. Um, but the reality is, I think that they, they took nothing for granted and there were no assumptions, you know, going into the task force. Great. Yeah, I think the governor's leadership has been really solid. I mean, it's whenever you're criticized heavily by both sides, I think you're getting the tension right there. Uh, so let me ask you this. What as we sit here today, I know there's been a shift in phase one that we've entered. But what percentage overall of industry and businesses are at this point? roughly considered essential versus non-essential? I mean, when he made the designation initially, is it like half and half or is it, is it do you know how, where it even falls? I, I think it's hard to say. I mean, I think because, you know, you gotta remember even before, you know, Florida started any kind of process with, you know, with shutdown, you know, the federal government through, you know, the Department of Homeland Security had essentially a, a pre-cooked list of what they considered essential businesses, which was pretty long. And also it was included in the stuff that we included, you know, people who are building roads and, and things like that. So, you know, there was a significantly long federal list in addition to our list. I, I wouldn't presume a guess. I think the folks obviously who, you know, we want to get up and running is a lot of small businesses who are kind of falling through the cracks, right? Certainly we all we all know about the restaurants, we all knew about the hotels. Um, but it's, you know, it's your, it's your mom and pop businesses, your dry cleaners and your others who, you know, who, are, you know, who need to get back open and feed their families. And also, John, I mean, obviously there's also those, those folks who've remained open, who've been essential, you know, take your gas stations, for example. Um, we can, we know through the collection of the gas tax um, that people have been home, they haven't been driving. Uh, so th those businesses are suffering well. So, you know, whether you are deemed essential or, 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 or not essential, uh, first of all, I hate that designation, right? Because a, a dry cleaner's business is essential to him and or to her and, and to their family and to their family's prosperity. So, um, but, I, but I think that whether those businesses were open or not open, I think that, that there's kind of suffering all around. And I think it's the governor's intent to, to try to get those businesses open as quickly and as safely as possible. Now, starting this week on Monday, we entered phase one. I know one of the cool things about that is you can actually go to restaurants now and they have to have a 25% capacity. What else has changed in phase one that we didn't have previously for, for those listening and for the public? Yeah, I think, you know, phase one, you obviously had some businesses reopen the, the restaurants, as you mentioned, you know, you also had, you know, they, they started, um, you know, a lot of the, the outdoor spaces, the state parks opened up. I think a lot of counties followed suit opening up outdoor spaces, which, you know, for, for a lot of people, um, you know, it was, is a huge outlet, you know, you know, I've got, like I said, I got two little, little boys. I mean, I need to, I need to go and run them, you know, I got to go get them out there and, and moving around and running, um, get some energy out. So that's a huge deal. They also, the hospitals, I think front was, is, is also a significant deal. We have, you know, tens of thousands of Floridians across the state. Um, and they talk about elective surgeries, no elective surgeries. Well, you know, I don't know what people's mindset is on elective surgeries, but you know, a knee replacement is considered a, an elective surgery you know, for the person who needs the knee replacement, that who's in a great deal of discomfort, you know, I'm not sure they think it's elective, you know, they, they really want to get it done. Um, so we started, we've loosened that up now so that hospitals can get back to the business of, of commerce, being cognizant of hospital space and hospital beds. Um, but I think that's another huge deal. Um, number one, it's a, it's a huge help to Florida patients. And number two, there's been a massive strain on our healthcare system by telling them to, to, to leave beds vacant, leave ORs vacant. Um, obviously, that's a revenue problem um, for them, as well as a, you know, a quality of care problem for, for their patients. So I think that was also, you know, a huge, a huge step. Great. Well, those are great uh, thoughts. So, um, so uh, Kevin, do we have questions for the speaker designate? Uh, we actually do. Um, one one's wanting more explanation, Speaker Sprouls, with regards to the budgetary impact. I know you touched on it. Briefly, yeah. I'm, I'm fielding questions and listening to uh, your comments already, but maybe you could elaborate a little bit. There was one interesting question about how's this going to affect the state overall with regards to, you know, fiscal policy, balance budgets and all those sorts of things. Yeah, now that's a great question, right? And, and there's a lot of unknown factors. I'll, I'll tell you what we what we know or what we think we know, right? We, as we were coming out of the legislative session, we already saw a significant drop off, as I mentioned before, on the gas tax. Uh, followed directly by, you know, um, a crushing blow and the collection of the sales tax. You know, you have 
obviously a lot of businesses closing. You have you know Walt Disney World and and uh, and Universal closing down. So the the predominant way that we you know we we tax ourselves here in Florida is, is through the sales tax. So both of those main collections have have dropped off. Um, so it's going to have significant budget impacts, you know, in in the years to in the months and the years to come uh, for the state of Florida. There's no question about that. Obviously, you know, people have talked a lot about the federal stimulus money. There's roughly, you know, five billion dollars that were, you know, that were appropriated by the federal government that's come to the states in the in the form of the CARES Act. Um, that's going to have what it's what I've I, the way I've characterized it to people is it's a really really expensive band aid. Um, you know, so it's it's going to be really meaningful. You know, in the short term, um, you know, it's not something where you know, you can spend a non-recurring amount of money on a recurring expense, right? You don't do that in your in your businesses or your churches. You know, if this is a one-time deal, I got to spend it on a one-time expense or in, or in the savings account. So I, I think that might that's going to help us get through um, some of the issues that we've had and the, and the amount of money that we've had to spend on COVID-19 response. But it's going to have significant budget impacts um, over our collections in, in the time to come. And, and let's be candid, you know, a lot of those businesses, a lot of those small businesses that we talked about are not going to reopen. There are going to be a lot of businesses in the state of Florida who will not financially be able to reopen their doors. And obviously that's going to create a strain uh, on the economy. So, you know, while I think, you know, that that's going to be a huge deal. The one, the, the upside that I would tell everybody is I believe that Florida came into this pandemic in a better fiscal position than the vast majority of our, of our state counterparts throughout the state or throughout, throughout the nation. I also think that because we are Florida, because we came in fiscally sound, because we've had fiscally sound, you know, management of the state for 20 some years, um, and because we're Florida, I don't think people come out of the pandemic and and say to themselves, you know, I'm going to go to Michigan to vacation, right? They're going to come to clear. They're going to come to Clearwater Beach. They're going to come to Miami. They're going to come to you know to to the the other coast to you know to the to the East Coast. So I, I think that between the the fiscal management of the state, between the fact that we are Florida, I do think that there's an opportunity for us to recover far quicker than the rest of the country. Great, Mayor Mutz. Um, so uh, I know that there's been the CARES Act, and our our website at uh, covidchurchaid.org has helped a number of nonprofits and churches around the country apply for the uh, the payroll protection money. Uh, but not, I know that's run out, but there are there funds now local and city that are being provided for those that didn't get, then I know there's thousands of institutions that apply but did not get funding. Are there local right. funds available? Yes, sir. And so uh, we have two things that have taken place locally. Two, our 211 United Way calls have been a principal in trying to handle the emergency scenarios, and they've done a great job of doing that using that um, number. Uh, secondarily, uh, the uh, our faith organizations have been very, very benevolent in terms of expand, expanding even beyond their congregations, the people that they can help in the process for which um, we're very grateful. And we've seen a lot of that take place. Uh, the money that the county received out of CARES is 126 million. That just got allocated yesterday. 40 million of that is gonna go to the small business owner that is 25 people or less uh, that weren't eligible, that didn't get PPP, they may have been eligible, but they didn't get any fund from PPP, and they have a critical uh, need to be able to survive up to $5,000. And um, then we will have 30 million of that appropriated towards uh, human services and some things that need to be done. Another 40 million uh, is going to go towards PPE and tests uh, so that we can increase the amount of testing going forward. And um, that's kind of the, been the big application we have another fund for mortgages and rents and um utility and needs as well and does, every, so, does every county have funds like that or just polk county no every fund er, every county got some of that federal distribution out of cares and so um polk at seven six hundred fifty thousand seven hundred thousand people get 126 million of it so it's the same federal money just coming in through the counties or Correct. the city Correct. And it allows, it's, it's the Band-Aid. I mean, that's a great, the Speaker Sproles is exactly right. It, this is a piece to go into place for the, the gym owners and some of the people that have just, you know, are trying to survive and are waiting for the next level of opening without knowing when that's going to be. And so uh, our encouragement in that regard is be creative be legal and be creative. I was riding my bike through, I ride early in the morning and I was riding my bike through Lakeland this morning and went through a neighborhood where there was a gym uh, person working with three people uh, in front of a house in a, in a driveway area. And, you know, where 
that was being done by appointment and you know they had had him come they're all six feet apart that's creative that's a good way to be able to do that and not violate anything and keep something in play that's not going to be the substantial amount of volume that they would typically have but it's a way to be able to do something and to help meet people's needs um, i've had a friend who committed suicide during this period of time and so this is the other side of that this is what happens when you get depressed and despondent and you don't talk to someone else and we have mental health problems rising we have suicide rates rising and that's the pressure backwards to get the economy back open because people live purposefully or not that's a great point um, we're having a question coming in uh, about local control and when are local governments going to be able to control the decisions rather than a state emergency order and so my understanding and speaker sprouse you can uh, follow up on this is that <clears throat> basically there's a couple of principles here as long as there's no constitutional right at play federal constitutional right i know for instance in religious liberty that would take prim you know proximity over both state and local uh, but as long as there's no fundamental right burden the the county or the state rather sets a floor and the county sets a ceiling so that whatever happens in the county it has to be at least the minimum standards provided by the state or in this case the order by the governor and that the uh the, the county provides a, a ceiling so that they can make uh, things more restrictive but not less restrictive than the state's order and so i hope that helps you uh, with the question that uh, came in regarding that yeah, I, I think it does. And I think that's an, that's an accurate, you know, legal assessment, John, what I would say is, I, I think this is more about leadership than anything else. You know, um, you know, when you talk about, you know, legal preemption versus leadership, right? You know, so for I'll use I'll use Tampa Bay, my, you know, my neck of the woods, um, not far from from the mayor. Uh, but, you know, they there, there was great confusion among the, you know, Pinellas County, Hillsborough County, you had mayors who were who were doing things um that was in my opinion was extremely confusing to the public what we needed was was the governor to do what he did which is to step up and say this is the standard that we expect um yes people can do you know they could do more if they think they really need to um but here's why we're doing it so they really shouldn't need to now if there's things that are just not contemplated because you know areas of the state are very very different you know a very metropolitan area is very different from a very rural area um then that's fine but but i think leadership is is key here i think one of the, the problems that we run into in, in situations like this is you know everybody's kind of trying to run to the microphone um and the reality is the, i think the appropriate way for us is to engage with e with each other um and and to allow you know leadership to take place in the, in the form of the governor here in florida to do what he did which is to lead on the issue you know one of the one of the things i'll give i'll give credit to south florida you know, Miami, Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach are really the epicenter of the cases that we've had, you know, across the state. And they've done it, they did a great job of really working together as, as a three counties to say, hey, let's be on the same page, regardless of whether you agree on whether that was the right page, it was the same page, which from a messaging standpoint to, to people in, the, in communicating those things to the, to the community um, was very, very important. One of the reasons that nothing was included in the first phase in Miami, Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach, in addition to them being the epicenter of the cases, was it was by their request. So they said, hey, listen, we, we wanna, there's some things we wanna get ready that we don't feel like we're ready yet. So give us another week or, or so to, to, get, to get those things kind of online so that we know we can handle this. And, and I think that's you know, what, what local government has done really well. Um, and then of course, there's been other examples like in my area where I think people added to the confusion. Great, thank you. Um, so Chancellor Eric Hall, a uh, question for you. Uh, talk to us about uh, uh, Richard Corcoran's leadership as the Commissioner of Education and what's going on with education in terms of reentry, uh, both private, uh, public, and even homeschool to the extent you all have interacted with those categories. Uh, you know, I'll set the stage from the beginning by saying you, you started with uh, Commissioner uh, Corcoran and you know, he has been leading from the forefront throughout this process in our education system by saying that we're going to do this with nothing less than compassion and grace across the board. And that's been, you know, his diligent message to all of us, our leadership team, and how we're working across the agency hand in hand with our, our local leaders that range from, you know, our early learning coalitions and our network of providers in the early learning space to the superintendents across the state that, you know, have really stepped up in a in a moment with, a, I use the term agility again, you know, has been very agile in transitioning to, you know, distance learning and virtual learning. And I think it's, it's important to kind of highlight that because, you know, many states just said, hey, we're closing schools. Well, 
No, we said we're closing campuses. We recommend you close campuses, but we didn't stop learning. What we said is that, no, we're going to transition to distance learning. And I think, again, that was a very, you know, intentional um, and strategic move because we know that, again, the great gains that Florida has made in education over the years has become, been because we have been very thoughtful about how do we build out virtual platforms, you know, being the front runner in the nation and having a Florida virtual school that, you know, every other state around the country reaches out to us and says, how's that system working? How are you deploying those resources? And some of those early decision points about, you know, how do you take a resource like Florida virtual school? And we moved quickly to kind of build out their capacity with adding more servers, building out the ability to, you know, serve more students on that platform if and when needed. But going back to our district leaders too, you know, Miami-Dade's a good example. Uh, some of the counties that have been, you know, as mentioned earlier with the, you know, kind of the epicenters, their superintendents moved to develop their instructional continuity plans and have been, again, out there out front and working with other superintendents around the state as an example of what it means to pivot and transition, again, not closing schools, but transitioning schools to these online and distance learning programs. And so I think as a state, again, we can be very proud of that work. And again, with the commissioner's leadership, and his commitment to compassion and grace throughout this process. I think our leaders across the state at the local level have been responsive to that and have just been stepping up. And, you know, it goes without saying that our educators have been the ones on the forefront of making those pivots themselves, you know, going from being in front of our students to, you know, now having to do that through a virtual platform or through distance learning. And again, I think we've, we've been definitely the national leaders in that space. So you know, public schools have a variety of summer things going on. Um, will those continue or will they be put on hold and done through video through the summer uh, before the fall comes? So I think, you know, as we look at, you know, how we make these, these transition points, you know, right now we're in this phase one of, of reopening. And, you know, when we looked at, you know, some of the decision points here recently around our school systems and just education in general, you know, we said, well, let's keep and really recommend that we keep campuses closed until the end of this school year, which for most it's around June 3rd is when that time period will come. So we're gonna you know, continue to work with districts. We are actually surveying them right now to get a good read of how many of the programs out there wanna operate in the summer. What does that look like? And so we're in that data gathering process and continuing to monitor and pay attention to the guidance from, from the governor, our you know, Department of Health, the CDC, and really trying to make an informed decision, collecting all the data and evidence that we need to do this in a, in a thoughtful and strategic way. And I think that's, that's yet to be you know, determined about how far you know we will go with the summer programs, but you know we're hopeful because we know that part of reopening the economy is being able to have you know families know that they've got dependable childcare and that there's you know their children are taken care of in these programs, and also bridging some of the learning loss that we're going to be concerned about right now in this point in time. You know, chance, let's let's talk about daycare because I know that as you advised the governor's task force, you had also put daycare in there and studied that. Was that considered an essential service initially? Was it not? And, and what's happening now in phase one? Is it any different? Well, I think when, let's, when we talk about essential service and we talk about, you know, early learning in our child care centers, you know, they were really the ones on the front line when you talk about supporting our workforce. I'll give you an example. One of the things that we got really, you know, just way out in front of was the need for child care for our first responders and our health care workers. And so we strategically worked with our network of providers around the state put incentives in place to help support them, to keep their doors open so that at a minimum, our healthcare workers and those that were out there on the front lines in our hospitals and our healthcare centers could have the childcare that they needed so that they could be focused also on their patients and those that are in this recovery mode of fighting with you know, the, the COVID virus. But I, I think at the same time, um, our daycare centers, I mean, they are trending up right now. You know, we were at a point just a couple of weeks ago where uh, only 44% of our centers were open we're now up to 52%. And so we're seeing this trend of what, for the most part, are small family owned businesses, these providers that are you know, providing childcare services, they are seeing the need to reopen and they're being responsive. And again, you talk about our educators in that space that are there you know, because they're committed to their kids and, the, and those that they're serving, they're out there doing the good work. And again, providing a resource so that again, the economy can start to reopen and we can get people back to work. So I think in our early learning space, you know, we're proud of how our coalition leaders, our providers have come up, you know, stepped up to really meet that challenge. And our Office of Early Learning is looking at how are they using the resources available to intentionally invest and put these incentives in place and doing that with our providers that are open and with the ones that are closed. How are we going to pivot in this moment 
to encourage and continue to build their capacity to reopen to meet local needs. So there's no doubt that our early learning space is gonna be critical in the reopening of the economy. And I think the great news is, is that our structure and our systems, um, while yes, they've been a little shaken through this process as we're dealing with this public health emergency, they at the same time have showed their vigilance and staying true to their, their purpose and their mission by continuing to have, you know, initially a little bit less than half, but now over half that are open and trying to provide a service to our families. And we see that trend continuing to grow in the weeks ahead. Great. Thank you, Chancellor. So we're going to have uh, Kevin do a question for a second. If you're just joining us, we're a little, little under halfway through our program here, a webinar on how to reopen Florida and reopen Florida's economy. We have as our guest panelists, uh, Speaker Designate Chris Sprouls, Chancellor of Education Eric Hall, and Lakeland Mayor Bill Mutz. If you have a question, go ahead and submit it. We'll try to get to it. There's been a number of questions. We'll try to get to the best ones uh, that we feel like are, are, are going to be helpful. So Kevin, go ahead. What uh, question do you have for the Chancellor? We have lots of great questions coming in, and so it's hard to choose from, but let's stay on the education topic if I can for just a moment. I had one asking about substitute teachers because they're not under contract, don't normally pay unemployment, did not know if there was any plan with regards to all of the substitute teachers that are out there, and I'll also just throw this one in alongside, is it a set deal that schools will be open in the fall? So. A lot of parts of that question, I'll start with the substitute teachers first. You know, first and foremost, again, as I mentioned earlier, we're working with our district leaders to evaluate and really try to understand the impact. You know, we've had great superintendent leaders that have been our thought partners throughout this process. Again, turning to speaker designate sprawls, you know, we have a great leader right there in his community with uh, Superintendent Grego, who has been a thought partner with us in a lot of this work. And I think the question around substitutes in a lot of aspects right now, we're continuing to unpack that and understand what that means. Um, you know, the good news is, is that I think we're building out frameworks with our partners that include our, our superintendents, even our college presidents, because we have to think about post-secondary in this discussion as well. Um, we're building out those, those processes and those strategies. And much like the CARES Act, we are building out a plan that helps to look at how do we leverage those dollars that are coming in through that investment um, to support these, these pivotal needs as we go to, you know, finishing out this school year, looking at what programs we're going to offer in the summer, and then you know, moving towards a plan that helps us to reopen school campuses then in the fall. I mean, that is definitely on our radar and that is our goal. But again, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that we're going to continue to track and follow, obviously, the guidelines and the guidance that's coming from our Department of Health and the CDC. But we, we are very hopeful and we are very encouraged by the fact that these trends that we're seeing are pointing us in the direction of being able to get our schools back on track in the fall, probably with some, you know, accommodations and adjustments that we'll have to make, you know, additional, you know, sanitizing, looking at you know, how do we uh, you know, make sure that our students are, you know, first and foremost and our staff uh, with safety and health on the for, you know, very forefront of all of those conversations. But our superintendents, again, they have been great thought partners and we're working with them to help, you know, evaluate and determine where we bridge some of these, these potential barriers. So I think we answered both of those questions kind of together, but, you know, definitely want to take care of our team members, our staff, and those that are on the front lines doing the work for our kids. But at the same time, looking at how do we make sure that we have safety and health at the very you know, forefront of every decision that we're making as we start to slowly kind of move into reopening you know, school campuses themselves for some of these summer programs and then into the fall with school. So next question, let's do a quick round robin with all three of our panelists. Hurricane season's right around the corner. Um, and of course, we hate to think about worst case scenarios and we hate to think about what that would be like. But has anyone thought about uh, a, a massive hurricane hitting us in the midst of this uh, situation and, and talk to us about uh, the state and, and county government's thought process in contingency planning. Who's first? Mayor. All right. Um, I would tell you that this is very much in our forefront in terms of contingency planning. We own our own utility like Jacksonville does and Orlando does. And um, when we have uh, um, hurricane planning in place, we have to think about how do we break our teams, our linemen teams up into small enough groups that we, if a COVID person tests positive in that group, we can pull that pod out 
and replace it with another pod in terms of the scheduling. So we're making those groups smaller as we go along. Uh, we started to worry and focus on that as we first took place in terms of the uh, uh, what was just happening normally here in town and recognizing that's part of our first responder group, really, uh, when we think about providing power. Uh, then the second thing we want to make certain is that at the hospital level that we have an adequate number of uh, tests reserved to be able to handle that. I think one of the ways that the governor wisely allowed us to have some retreat was we had over capacity for what we thought might occur and watched what had happened in New York and realized we didn't get to those crisis levels and so that we really did have elective surgery capacity and other things. Well, that same kind of measurement is going to need to take place when we're in a hurricane environment too in terms of uh, the depth of what might happen to people. And we have taken our hospital and divided it in it, which is a, um, a city facility uh, property, and so and divided it in half so that we have a COVID side and a non-COVID side so that as you're bringing in people from with problems that you can know which side you, you put them on it subsequent to their test. Uh, so I think we have to have all that in place and anticipate uh, that it goes there. I'm going to cheat and weigh in just a sec uh, a bit on the camps for this summer. I personally am an advocate of us having recognizing that we have child care issues, not having camps. Because if we want to have a safe opening in the fall, one of the ways that we do that is keep kids as separated as we can during the course of summer, knowing that that's difficult. And so I think it is an opportunity for the church, faith-based organizations, to be able to have some extension of people who might be able to watch kids where there needs to be that case. And, and we ought to think about that. Plan for camps. If they occur, great. But they're going to occur at a smaller level anyway in terms of the number of kids that could participate and have an alternate plan in place as they go forward. Uh, then if we have uh, hurricanes and uh, camp issues, you know, we, we have some, some things melding in place so people have some alternative plans. Don't just focus on this is my one reprieve. Speaker Designate, talk to us about hurricanes and what the state has uh, discussed in terms of contingency planning. Yeah, look, John, we're Florida, right? So we always have to be, you know, prepared for hurricanes. I, I've spoken at length with Director Moskowitz over the last several months, you know, on a weekly basis, whether that's on, you know, COVID-19. We, we spoke most recently about hurricane season for the reason that you said, hey, we, you know, we're dealing with this crisis, but let's not, you know, you know, take our eye off the ball of what we what we typically know is a is a, an occurrence that happens in Florida fairly regularly, which is hurricanes. So, you know, he, he assured me, and, and he's done a great job uh, during this pandemic. He did a great job during the hurricane hurricanes that we dealt with over the last year and uh, that Florida is going to be you know prepared to do what we need to do uh, to uh, to make sure that we can respond to whatever's coming you know during hurricane season. Great and Chancellor Hall. Yeah, I would just reiterate I mean the director's done an amazing job you know the updates that he was providing during the task force and the thoughtfulness that I think um, the Department of you know emergency management has really taken at this point you know they've just been a great partner I think with all the agencies trying to understand everything from what do we do when it comes to sheltering? You know, if we if we have to have emergency shelters open, what does that look like? You know, he shared on some of those calls the examples of, you know, where maybe historically we've used school facilities. You know, if we have to have degrees of, you know, additional you know precautions or things that we have to take. You know, with ramping up testing. You know, rapid test results. Uh, even looking at maybe using alternatives like vacant hotels. You know, how do we do these in these things in a way that, you know, create the safest conditions for everybody? Whether you're someone that's been impacted by COVID or someone that is trying to mitigate the risk of being impacted by COVID. Um, I just can tell you, I think, you know, while it's uh, unfortunate that we have to think about hurricanes, I think actually the fact that Florida has been a state that's had to recover and deal with hurricanes in the past is one of the reasons that our state has fared well during this emergency crisis, because we know what it means on, typically on a regional level to deal with these emergencies. Unfortunately, we're having to do it statewide. But again, I think the precautions and the lessons learned that we've had with emergency management has prepared our state to respond in ways that some of the states who are not accustomed to dealing with crisis like these, um, they've struggled in some cases. So I think the fact that we have a good, strong emergency management system, a great director who's out there leading and coordinating with other agencies, um, we are very, you know, hopeful that, you know, hopefully, you know, nothing, ha you know, nothing happens this season. But if it does, I think the conversations that I've heard and the uh, types of steps that are being considered and put in place for if and when needed. I think we can have a lot of confidence and faith that uh, our folks are doing the work that's needed to be prepared if and when that were to happen. Great. 
Uh, speaker designate, let's talk about something that uh, uh, is a little bit more fun and people oriented. Let's talk about theme parks. Um, are they basically on their own in terms of thinking about when to reopen? Um, what are they thinking and is the state looking to them or are they looking to the state in terms of the timing of all of that? And, and that's important for both vacations for Floridians and also revenue to the state. Yeah, I, I think it's a two it's a two way street, right? I think that you know we're looking at them, they're looking to us in the sense that obviously the governor is not going to take his you know his hands off the wheel when you're talking about you know a large gathering of massive amounts of people on something that's really important to the state from a financial uh, standpoint. At the same time, obviously you know Disney and Universal have both an interest in in you know reopening uh, their businesses, but also doing it in a way that's safe. I mean you know Disney and, and you know, these these organizations have built a brand that they don't want to lose, so they don't want to open up and have problems either. I do think one thing that we need to draw to distinctions about, and this really isn't necessarily about, you know, Disney and, and, and the theme parks, but just kind of just a bigger, you know, standpoint is we have to make a huge distinction between inside and outside, right? I mean, all of the infectious disease experts that I have talked to have said, look, when you are outside, we're not saying gather, you know, your, your, your 500 strangers that you met that day and, and, and sit around and hug each other. But at the same time, you know, you, you don't, you know, you're outside, you know, go to the park. You don't need to wear a mask when you're at the park. You know, walk around, um, you know, go to the beach, you know, go, go do things outside and outdoors. It's good for you. It's good for your health. And also the, the ability and transfer of this disease is far more limited in an outdoor space than it is an indoor space. So I say that to you because, you know, I have more concerns about, you know, opening up an arena than I do about opening up the beach, right? But every time you turn on the television, all the attention is at the beaches. Um, I think that the vast majority of the medical experts have focused and said, look, you know, outside spaces, you know, let's start to kind of open those up. Even the folks I talked to who I think probably took the most conservative of your medical approaches as far as, you know, saying, hey, let's really creep into opening things up said, hey, by all means, open the parks, by all means, open the beaches, you know, get those outdoor spaces open. So, you know, I think it's important that people realize those distinctions, John. And I think because of the confusion on some of the media reports, I don't really think it's necessarily getting out there. That's a, such a great point. And that's so helpful and straightforward. Um, I think we're, you know, as I heard one of the experts talking about this, this is not an aerosol. This is not something that's just floating. These are droplets coming out of people's mouths that drop to the ground. And if it's humid, uh, they drop quicker uh, than it does if it's cold outside. And so hopefully the summer will help cur uh, curb some of this. Um, Let's go on to uh, talk about uh, just something practical. What, there's a lot of pastors on this call, a lot of Christian businessmen. What can churches do if they want to be intentional about, let's say, there's, let's say there's 20 to 25 small businesses in a church. What can that church do collectively to, to support and help uh, the small business community? Or is it just simply uh, nothing that they can do? No, I, look, I think they, there's a lot they can do, and I wouldn't presume to, you know, tell pastors or churches kind of how I think that their their ministry should should address us. I think that they're going to know that based on their experience sure. with these folks. And look, I think some of the even the very very, you know, what I consider very purposeful, um, but also very helpful things is, you know, many of the churches, and I've talked to several pastors in our area to kind of see how they're doing. A lot of them are calling, they're, they're calling and checking in with members of their congregation, particularly ones that they know are, are alone or are elderly, um, to check in on them. Hey, how are things? Let's, let's have a conversation. Maybe it's just a talk, you know, how, how are you doing? You know, the mayor talked about depression um, and how that's impacted by, by being alone and being isolated. You know, I'm surrounded by, you know, I have my wife, I have my two boys, so I, I never, I never, you know, are bored for things to do, John. But, you know, there are people who are alone. There are people who are alone. And, uh, and I think just a phone call to them and being purposeful is, is, is very, very meaningful. Um, and the churches, I think, have done a great job of, of, you know, of figuring out, hey, we never expected this. How, how, do we, how do we reach out to our congregations in ways that maybe we hadn't anticipated? Maybe we had a digital platform that we, you know, we were always digital. Um, maybe we weren't, and now we're having to, to figure out a way to do that. I, I do think, and I, I want to be optimistic here for a minute, and, and, I'll, and I'll talk about the churches, John, and I'll talk about education. You know, for, for the, you know, the first time, you know, ever, and certainly in, in my lifetime, you know, you have now, you know, thousands of teachers throughout the state uh, who are, for the first time, figuring out, all right, I'm going to have to do digital content. You know, maybe I never had to do that before. I don't work for Florida Virtual. I've never done an online class. I never wanted to. But now I'm in a situation where I've got third graders or fifth graders or, or, or eighth graders who need their teacher. And I'm going to rise to the occasion and I'm going to figure out the best way to do it. And I've learned the good things and the bad things and, and how to do this and how to reach the kids. And maybe I've realized that it's a great tool for some aspects of learning and not a great thing for others. My point is, is that whether that's a pastor in a church 
or ministers in a church or whether it's teachers, we now have tens of thousands of experts throughout this state through experience who are now battle tested and battle hardened to deliver, you know, to deliver their ministry or deliver their educational content in ways that they never anticipated. And I, and I believe that that when this, before this story is done being written, that the real heroes in this story, in addition to all the first respondents and the healthcare professionals are going to be your teachers and your ministers who figured out a way to do this. And by the way, when this is all done, that innovation and that work and that sweat equity that they put into doing those things is going to have amazing consequences for, for ministry. It's going to have amazing content uh, uh, consequences on how we teach kids in the state. And I think that that's going to be the real innovation that comes out of this, John. You know, I, I read not long ago that, you know, I think it was Isaac Newton who came up with some of his laws of, of science while he was in quarantine for a year. You know, that innovation came to him during a time of quarantine. And I think the same is going to be true for our teachers. The same is going to be true for our business owners and our, and our ministers. Mayor Mutz, I know you have some similar comments about looking at this uh, from the back end. Yeah, I really do. I really think we have a lot of benefits that are going to come out of this. But I want to go straight to the churches. Some of the experts that can participate in those classes that the speaker designate just talked about are sitting in our churches. And they can be added in. I did a, uh, a civics class this morning. Uh, up for seventh graders to talk about uh, how to do that. That's a teacher saying, hey, who can we bring in that could talk about this topic? And so within our churches, we have experts of people that could make themselves available to classes uh, across the community. We have a fabulous superintendent, Jackie Bird in uh, Polk County, who is super creative and, uh, you know, very um, leads by example, she's a servant leader. And so she's in the midst of doing things and welcomes that kind of participation. And so uh, we can do that. The other thing we could do is find people in our church that have skills that owned their own business and are small and aren't doing anything right now and are in the non-essentially described category that could maybe perform some things for the church that the church needs to get done. And that can be a way that the church can benefit from the time that they have them available that wouldn't happen otherwise. And cost effectively to accomplish something that wouldn't uh, you know, get done anyway and, and uh, benefit the person who helps to do the work. So I think we want to be creative and step back and say, okay, what can we do that can help the community at large that wafts the gospel to people as a result of uh, our participation in, in a, a greater area of opportunity than we would normally have? That's great. Uh, great thoughts. Uh, speaker designate, um, I know that there's been a lot of talk in, in state and federal governments about the possibilities of enacting special uh, laws to limit liability from lawsuits that could come uh, as a result of this. Is that a discussion that's happening here in Florida? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's on the top of, of the mind, particularly of small business owners. And, and look, there should be protection for people who are reopening their business, who are trying to do the right thing, not just by themselves and their, you know, their employees, but also their customers. You know, they shouldn't have to worry about, you know, uh, about nonsense, um, particularly as it relates to a, a global pandemic. So certainly it's a conversation that's happening, John. You know, I'm hoping, I'm hopeful that, you know, uh, we don't see the kind of, of things, uh, you know, commercials going up and things like that, that would, that would be unflattering uh, to the state and unflattering to, to lawyers. Uh, so hopefully that doesn't happen, but I think we all realize that number one, it might, and number two, even if it doesn't happen, there is certainly uh, an anxiety level on behalf of business owners that it could happen. And does that stint their ability to lean into a full reopen and get, get open up for commerce? So it's certainly a conversation that we're, we're having actively. Sure. Chancellor, you had something to say. I just let that guy just cut you off and I'm sorry. No worries. Listen, I, I think uh, again, this is a healthy conversation. I think the, the feedback is awesome. And I just, you know, would kind of further expand on, you know, the role that you know, our, our church leaders and our congregations and others can really, you know, help right now is that, and I'm going to speak about this really from kind of a personal perspective. Um, you know, as I mentioned, my wife's a school social worker, and we know that families out there in many cases might be struggling right now. Our schools have done a great job of stepping up to provide meal services and making sure that, you know, some of our children and families have the greatest needs. Our schools have opened, you know, their facilities to try to provide these meals, even though a lot of it's curbside, we're still helping to get families the needed, you know, support that they need with food. But our churches can also play a great role in helping some of the what I call the non-academic barriers that also face our families. You know, some of the things that deal with basic needs. And as you know, schools are trying to coordinate and help families that might have everything from clothing needs to sheltering needs. I'm not saying that the churches have to play that role, but our churches already do so much of that already. I would just encourage the churches that are partnering with our schools and are used to partnering in ways that when school campuses are open, 
that they, you know, hopefully can continue some of that support, even in this distance learning time, yeah. where we still have families out there in some cases that continue to, need, you know, have right. those and those types of supports in place. And uh, so just want to call that out as well. Yeah. So let's talk for a second about graduation. I know my son is in the class of 2020. Uh, he came in on 9-11 and he's coming out on COVID. This is an extraordinary uh, group of young people who are going to change the world. But what are you seeing around the state in terms of graduation ceremonies and commencement and all that? Uh, are, are, what are you seeing in terms of creativity to replace some of the normal things that where we'd have a mass around of people getting their degrees uh, graduated from high school? Well, I would tell you, I mean, again, I use the term innovation. I, I think the speaker does mention that term earlier. They're being innovative and they're being creative and they're doing it first and foremost with kids in mind. I mean, you know, for all of us, I mean, at least again, I'll go back into my own experience. That was just a major rite of passage. I mean, that was the closing of one chapter and opening of a new one. And that, that rite of passage, you got to think the impact that's happening on, you know, so many of our young people out there and, and kind of missing that opportunity. And so our schools and our districts have stepped up, you know, from seeing, you know, some districts doing drive-in graduation ceremonies where uh, the superintendent might be up in front in a, in a large parking lot and, you know, everybody's staying in their car, they're social distancing, they're doing those things that we know the CDC continues to provide guidance on, but they're trying things like that, you know, doing a, a, a drive-by graduation where, you know, the principal and the superintendent can hand a diploma to the student, you know, while they're driving by in their car. Um, seeing pictures that have the graduates lining the driveway of the schools and it's just, again, it's been amazing to see how our, our colleges, our, you know, secondary schools with our high school students, everybody's trying to really find a way to make sure that we honor and celebrate. And I think the um, compassion and grace, I use those terms as our commissioner has kind of stepped to, our superintendents have stepped up and our school leaders have stepped up. And they're doing this with such a high degree of compassion and grace that recognizes and celebrates and doesn't risk losing that kind of rite of passage, you know, for our students. We've heard some districts are exploring options of maybe moving some graduation ceremonies back to a little bit later in the summer as we see, you know, how things continue to progress with a much, much smaller groups or breaking graduations down into such small group sizes where students can still come get that picture, you know, with the, their principal. And, but again, we're seeing that across the board. And uh, I think the good news is, is that with graduation ceremonies, we're seeing some innovative steps. And we know also with our, you know, post-secondary institutions, they recognize that some students who may have needed some additional supports during this transition, they're laying the groundwork to be ready to receive those students with open arms and supports going into the fall. I saw one uh, high school, I, can't, I don't know if it was a Florida high school or not, but they had had large campaign yard signs of each student blown up their picture. And it was like the yearbook on the lawn. So as people were driving by, they could literally see the sea of graduates. I thought that was very, very touching and very appropriate as well. Was that a Florida uh, high school, do you know? Chance. I didn't go back and look, but we've seen some examples of that around the state. I can't see, I can't tell if that specific story was in Florida, but we've seen a lot of examples of similar things, even right here in Tallahassee with a school that was doing something very similar. Um, so wherever it started, I can tell you it's caught on. And uh, again, I think, you know, this is a time and place, you know, many of us that are parents, many of us that serve in the education space, you know, let's face it, we're all in the business of helping people. And when we can celebrate and acknowledge the achievements of our young people as they get ready to make that transition, um, it is an important right. We want to make sure that we celebrate and acknowledge that, and our districts are making that happen. Speaker Designate Sproles, I have a couple of business and financial questions I want to ask you. Um, what percentage of the relief dollars uh, coming uh, are coming from federal versus state? Is the state actually directly appropriating relief? And what percentage overall that's being appropriated is state versus the federal? And then secondly, I know Florida has a balanced budget amendment. You all have to be responsible, which is a great thing here in Florida. You have to balance the budget. Um, and I think that probably means this year there's gonna be cuts from things that would normally be funded otherwise. Can you talk to us about those two uh, things? Sure. Yeah. Look, the, the money that's come down from the federal government, a lot of it has come and said, hey, you know, the, this this certain amount of money has to be allocated to, to this thing. There's strings attached as to, as to where it can where it can end up. I think there is a move afoot, John, to um, to encourage the federal government, particularly with states 
who are coming into the pandemic, who've, who've managed their affairs uh, well, who have AAA bond ratings, who had billions of dollars in reserve, you know, who've been you know, fiscally prudent, their states weren't bankrupt, you know, to give them more you know, financial flexibility on how to backfill that money. So I think that conversation is underway at the federal level. Uh, so you know, we've got the money, a lot of it is strings. It all goes into unallocated general revenue. Um, I think the important part of that is, uh, you know, as you mentioned, you know, because collections are down, um, all, of the, all of our budgets were based on assumptions um, none of those, obviously those assumptions were, you know, were interrupted in a pretty significant way. So, you know, the more flexibility that we have um, with the money that came down from the federal government, the more of the ability that is to kind of, you know, backfill the, the reserve funds, which is the primary responsibility here. And then I think as we move forward, no question that we're, you know, we're certainly going to be in for cuts. I mean, we're certainly not going to be in for healthy budget years like we've had over the last several years. It's going to be a time to really dig deep. Uh, to prioritize what's the most important thing for Floridians and to make those kinds of choices. You know, we're not the federal government, as you mentioned, you know, we don't, we don't print money, we don't run up deficits, um, you know, we have a balanced budget amendment. And I also think one of the, from a leadership standpoint, one of the most important things as we come into something like this is to really remember that, you know, as we, the, the, the quickest way out of this is to not forget about how we managed the state over the last 25 years. You know, we came into this pandemic very fiscally sound, we don't want to put ourselves in a situation two or three years from now where we're in rough shape but because, because instead of making tough choices, we tried to take the easy way out in the short term and really create a devastating consequences for, you know, for our children, our grandchildren in the long term. So, you know, as we look at this, it's not going to be what's the two or three year financial outlook. It's going to be, you know, what does the state look like in 30 years, whether that's on a budget front or on a policy front? And how can we put ourselves in the best situation to recover quickly, to get families and businesses back on their feet, and, and also not make the kind of mistakes that, that people tend to make uh, when they feel pressure? Speaker, I know that around the country there's been a movement, and it's usually in states where the governor's probably been overreaching and not been as measured and balanced as Governor DeSantis has been. But there is a move to pass laws or constitutional amendments to limit ex executive power in times of emergency, perhaps to 30 or 60 days, and then any further spending or orders would require a legislative approval. Uh, is that kind of conversation happening here in Florida? Look, I think we're always certainly cognizant about how things happen, but I, I think the governor has had a, a super measured approach. In, in Florida, I think our, our executive powers are probably pretty significant in large part because we have to deal with these things and hurricanes and things like that that happen whenever they choose to happen, not when we set them. Um, but at the same time, you know, the legislature is, you know, still in control of, you know, of, of appropriating money, is still in control of what the laws are in the state. You know, people have talked about, well, let's change the law by executive order. Well, obviously, the governor isn't attempting to do that and hasn't done that and, and wouldn't do that. I think we also are lucky that we have a governor who, who understands the separation of powers, having come from the Congress to, to the governor's mansion. Um, so I think he understands the importance of that. He's a, he's a guy who's read the Federalist Papers from beginning to end, John, um, and knows what they say. So that's, that's a very helpful thing, uh, certainly from us in the legislature. And, uh, and he's been a great partner. You know, I've talked to the governor nearly every single week about what's happening, um, about how we can be helpful and, and, and giving thoughts about the best way for Florida to recover. So it's not something that we've had to struggle with, like you've seen protests and things like that in, in other, in other you know, places uh, you know, throughout the country. So you are about to become the second most powerful political figure in the state of Florida under the governor. Uh, and obviously we can't be assured that any governor is going to be as responsible as the governor we have. Would you support a bill that would require some check by the legislative branch after a 30 day emergency period? I, I think I look, I look at anything. I think the, the more important thing is, you know, the check on what? Is it a check on financial spending? You know, we have those kinds of checks. So, for example, if you went back, you know, 10 years ago, Kevin, I'll tell you, you know, if an agency did something in rulemaking, for example, and it was going to cost the taxpayers $10 million, that wouldn't necessarily that come back to the come back to the legislature. The House in particular led on that issue and said, no, 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 no. We're not going to allow, you know, government, you know, executive branch agencies to do that. And then the Florida taxpayers have to foot the bill. That's going to have to come back to us if it's over, you know, a million dollars so that we can do that. So I think the House in particular has been extremely aggressive on ensuring that there's accountability to ensuring that there is a check and balance that, that as the founders intended to make sure that, that there isn't a runaway branch, whether that's the executive branch or the judicial branch. Um, we've been very, very aggressive in, in doing that. So, you know, it's, it's not a challenge that we've had, uh, but certainly as we go, you know, we'll always be, you know, willing to, to look at things as they come up to make sure that everything's working. But, you know, like I said, I have no concerns with that with Governor DeSantis.
great. We're going to get to some questions now. Before we do, uh, Jimmy Patronus, who's the chief financial officer in the state of Florida, was going to be with us. But actually, last night, some fires broke out in North Florida, actually very close to where he's from in Bay County. And he's also the chief fire marshal. So he, with profound uh, apologies, he was not able to be here because he's doing his job as the CFO in North Florida, uh, working with firefighters on those uh, deadly fires. So Kevin, what kind of questions do we have uh, next? You're on mute. Yeah, let me, uh, let me advocate for the pastors here for just a second. Um, some of them are asking about the COVID tests and uh, are there quick response tests because some of them aren't accessing hospitals to visit on sick parishioners and uh, then moving maybe if they're in South Florida in Miami and then they come back to Duval uh, to be able to have quick tests. Do any of you know anything as to where we are with the COVID testing and uh, there was a question about the false positives. How reliable are they becoming? Any updates in this area? I can certainly speak from a county standpoint. Um, we have within the um, uh, area of Polk County worked together with the hospitals. We do, it, you, you ramp up quick tests based on the needs and primarily quick tests are for surgeries, for hospital applications, those kinds of things. The split in wings is becoming a very important part of this. So there'd be a wing that would be safe to visit. The real need is that they've been tested so that we know that they don't have an issue. And so um, as they would come in to do some of that visitation, we want to be careful on the acceleration of those kinds of things, particularly when we could perhaps encourage people and families who have parishioners that may be in the hospital to have phone visits by uh, the pastors. It's a more protective thing for both uh, the person they're visiting as well as the congregation that they go back to if they're meeting at any level at all. Uh, and so we would encourage that that's done that direction as we go forward. We're going to see more testing and we're going to see timeliness in that testing take place throughout the state because we're allocating so many more dollars and the, gov and the federal supply of those are flowing to Florida more readily. But um, Running too fast in this regard is probably not the thing that uh, I would encourage. I would think that um, trying to find other methods to see those people would be wiser in this crawl period. Kevin, what else you got? Great. Um, this one will make you smile, but I think it's a great relevant question. I had one ask about what would you say, since you're all involved in the civic arena, what do you say to the conspiratorial theorists that are out there who believe the government is working against them instead of working for them. What can you do to help people have a confidence in this partnership with what you all are endeavoring to do? I have strong opinions on this one. Um, and, you know, and I come from a private business background. And, and so this is my first in, stint in government in the first place in my life at all. Um, we need to make certain we live out Romans 13. We have a responsibility to competent government providers to honor them and to honor the people who are protecting us. That's the purpose of it. Conspiracy theories flourish in problems and pointing to somebody as the culprit for a one world order becomes centerpiece and it doesn't transpire. And so what I want to encourage us to do is we know how the book ends when we read, you know, scripture, we can tell how uh, what's going to happen. But in the meantime, rather than to be so focused on pointing fingers, be focused on using your heart to provide provision for other people, spend your energies that direction and recognize that we have great leadership in our governor. We have good leadership at our federal level in terms of what's being done. We, we had, for the first time in our history, a government who took massive programs and let them be decided at the local levels and to trust the local levels that existed, which is why it was deployable and is not deplorable. Those are two different things. And so I just think we, as, as a church, should lead our parishioners into focusing on what we see, not what we fear. So I just want to make a couple of comments there. I think that when we get on the other side of this crisis, we will have learned some things. There might be some things we do differently. But I think uh, given the fact that where we're at, we have to trust, in a sense, 
uh, our leaders at this point, even if we don't agree with them, um, we have to trust their leadership. And I think that that's uh, an important thing as we move forward. And yeah, we may learn some things that we didn't understand. We may understand there's some forces at work uh, on hindsight, but for right now, I think given all that we're into, we have to just continue with the planning uh, and be responsible. And I think I think your point is well taken, uh, Bill. Uh, uh, you know, we have godly men right now, at least in Florida and in the federal government, or at least following godly men. And so I think that's a, an important thing. Uh, Kevin, you have another question. Um, I do. Uh, I had one interestingly, and this this is a large swath of people. How are the farmers of Florida doing? Someone Great asked. Question. Great I want question. to know uh, how that group is faring. Well, John, I'll, I'll hop in there, and uh, certainly the mayor can talk to that being from, from Polk County. But, you know, the uh, I, first, first I want to address that last question, if I can, Kevin, because I think it's important. I think the mayor, you know, said very, very well, and so did John. But one thing I would say where I think the burden is on, is on us, right, as, as leaders, is, you know, to earn, earn that trust and earn that confidence. And I think that the best way to do that, particularly with all of the confusion that's out there and all of the media, and we know no matter what data says, there's going to be a a headline because they, they want clicks and they're going to try to drive the, that, that's all built into the cake. We know that. Right. So I think where, where leaders, you know, um, I think have an obligation is to make sure that we are giving the un, unvarnished truth, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly of what is happening. And when there are mistakes that are made rather than trying to, you know, to, to, to say that the, the mistake was something that it wasn't just say, Hey, listen, it was a mistake. You know, it was an error. Um, and when we get through this, John, to your point, you know, in hindsight, you know, I would be shocked, right? Shocked if there weren't dozens of things uh, in hindsight where you'd say, well, if I knew that at the time, I would have done this differently. I, I think that's fine. I think that's good. I think that builds confidence. I mean, how many of us have done something wrong to someone and, say, and, and, and find ourselves in a, in a situation of apologizing? And usually that person goes, okay, thanks for the apology. And that's it, right? Uh, I think the, the American people, I think Floridians, they want people to just own whatever it is. Hey, this is what I think right now based on this information. I could be wrong. Um, here's what's happening. Here's, the, here's where we messed up and we're super sorry. Here's what we're doing to trying to fix it. So I think that is upon us as leaders to, to, to own those things and give people the confidence to say, well, if he's admitting his mistakes over here, chances are we're getting at least the most of the truth. So I, I think that that is a, you know, a wildly you know, a wildly important aspect of, you know, of leadership during, you know, during this time and, and during this pandemic. And, and as far as farmers are concerned, you know, I look, you know, you want to talk about stepping up. I, I, I always tell people, you know, I'm a, I'm a lawyer by trade. Um, there might be some people on the call who are in the medical profession, nurses and doctors, we super appreciate you. You know, I always say, you know, it's uh, every once in a while, you might need a lawyer, you know, you might need a doctor if you get sick, uh, but you need a farmer three times a day, right? Um, they have done an amazing job of, you know, of feeding America, for giving us confidence that we're going to go to Publix and that there's going to be food to feed our families. And, and, and let's be honest, at the beginning of this, there was a lot of anxiety about, about that. You saw you go to Publix and they would limit you to one milk or one, you know, one thing of meat or whatever. That's now changed. And I think that's because you know, the farmers have stepped up, the supply chain, the truck drivers who are kind of unsung heroes of keeping our supply chain open. Um, have done their job and done it really, really well. So we're super appreciative to the, the agriculture community and the supply chain folks who've kept our Publix's uh, stock for our families. Bill, you have any thoughts on that? In, uh... I echo those comments. I think we're seeing a phenomenal response, a lot of agility. Uh, we're we're going to have squeeze points in the supply chain. There's no question. We just You have that when you have this many people out of the workforce and you have the demand to not eat in restaurants that creates the supply increase at homes. But just as Publix is up a billion dollars, I think this last month in terms of sales, you, you, they'll have a softening on the other side of that in terms of uh, eating that down, you know, because people stocked up. And so uh, we're going to see that level out. I, I'm optimistic about a healthy economy in the fall. I really am. And, and I don't mean that we're 100% back, but I think we can be 70, 80% back if we remain prudent and crawl, walk, run. Great. So I have uh, one more question for the speaker designate, and then I want to do a closing question for everybody. But let's talk about something that's very real. I know the governor seems to talk about every time he speaks, and that's uh, hair salons and gyms. Uh, does phase two anticipate um, uh, releasing those uh, professionals to get back to their work, or is that a phase three function? And talk to us about uh, that. 
I know uh, probably a lot of people on this call are interested in haircuts, except for a couple in the center there uh, that have no need for such a service. So, hey, uh, I, I'll be honest. I thought that I get more texts about you know gyms and barber shops. I I gotta say it's you know hair salons and nail salons that have really been the uh, the the focal point of a lot of the messages that I've been getting. Look, I think I think we all want to get them up open as soon as possible. I think that's why you saw Governor DeSantis uh, doing kind of. Uh, you know, in the barber shop type town halls with barbers and hair salons and folks is, is trying to say, hey, you know, try to understand it, right? You know, none of us, you know, those of us who, who you know, don't, haven't cut hair, um, you know, and I haven't ventured to try to do that, you know, how does that business, you know, how does that business work, practically speaking? What's the best way to do that? I think that's what the governor was trying to do. I anticipate that, you know, you know, based on the data, based on what we've seen some other states doing, based on the conversations that the governor was having, you know, inside those barber shops, you know, that we're going to see those things begin to open up, John, and the governor is going to do the same thing that he's done in the first phase, which is to come out and to say, this is what we're doing. Here's why we're doing it. Here's the data that suggests that this works, and here's the plan. Um, and I think part of that is, one, to let, let people know that it's been thought through. And the other part, which is just equally important, is to build consumer confidence that, hey, it's okay to, to, you know, to venture out and go, you know, go get your hair cut, go get your nails done. Great. So final question I want to ask, and then we'll close, the, close and I'll ask Kevin to pray for all of you. Uh, but um, if you could say one thing to the citizens of Florida, uh, you know, one th about how to become a part of the solution and not a part of the problem. I know people are very frustrated. Uh, social media is just loaded with people who are frustrated, who are angry. What, what, what can we do collectively as the faith community, as church leaders, as Christian business leaders, to be a part of the solution, not part of the problem? Uh, and I'm going to ask Eric to start with that and, and go to Bill and we'll end with the speaker does. So, yeah, I would start by saying this. I mean, one is, you know, we need to recognize that as a state, we are, we are just a resilient state. We have resilient people. And this is a time of, again, just taking care of each other. You know, we got to take care of ourselves. We got to take care of our loved ones, but in doing so, we got to take care of our neighbors. And I think being focused on that while recognizing that we need to follow the good guidance and the good leadership that we've been you know, able to receive here in the state of Florida, you know, from our governor, the guidance that he's providing on a regular basis and the updates uh, to the Department of Health that is trying to make sure that we're getting information out in a way that is strategic, you know, really pay attention to that information, be responsible, because again, it's no longer just about, you know, mitigating your exposure to getting sick. It's about the risk that you have to others and, and also that joint responsibility you have to others to not spreading something where we don't need to. And again, I can tell you, it has been while challenging, and yes, you know, we've got some hurdles and things that we have to continue to navigate. But as I walk around my neighborhood now, and I don't know how many of you as you're walking around your neighborhood see more people out walking. Um, I think that's a testament to the people of Florida is that we're outside, we're talking to each other, we're engaging, we're keeping our social distance, but we're recognizing the need to care for each other. And, you know, I would tell you this, kind of setting it an agency perspective, um, to see how our agencies are collaborating in ways that are just unprecedented. I mean, there's no egos, there's nothing. It is all about serving the people of Florida and we're coming together to figure things out. And I think giving the, you know, the, the citizens of Florida the confidence that our agency leaders, our hard workers that are on the ground doing the good work to keep you know, Florida you know, moving forward as we continue to reopen you know, in phases, the, the full economy and businesses, and just, again, take this time to care for each other while caring for yourself and do the things that we know or not only about keeping your faith in God and you know those aspects of our life, but keeping faith in each other and supporting each other, and all of us really you know look at this as a period of time to be servants in this work and uh, do what we do best. Let's be resilient and let's take care of each other. Great work, Chancellor Mayor. Amen. So I would say focus on what you can do, not what you can't do. It is the deceivers ploy to make us focus on what I'm not having a right to have something I can like to do happen in my life. Instead, focus on what you have time to do and be creative and what you have the capacity to do and the lives you have the capacity to touch. I love Winston Churchill's line that no wars are ever won by evacuations. You know, we don't win this by retreating and whining and complaining. We win this by doing and reflecting and serving. And so, um, uh, the church ought to be the number one place that provides servant leadership uh, as an example and to, to the community. And this is a great time for us to be able to reflect uh, values that are biblical in a very solid, 
life-giving, life-changing way on a daily basis. Speaker, Squirrels. I appreciate that. Look, I, I think those are great. And I, I would sum them, I would sum them both up uh, this way, you know, love, love your neighbor, right? And, and all the things that go along with that. And I, and I think that, that that is the most important thing that we all can do, certainly as individuals uh, and as leaders. You know, some people are in a, are in a mode right now where they need, a, they need an ear to listen to. You know, they, they need somebody to just show them some level of compassion. Um, there's some people who, you know, are very angry uh, right now. They, they need the same kind of us to be able to lead in. But it is, you know, what I would say to all of those people is, you know, number one, I, if you're watching the news, you know, 12 hours a day, you know, cut down on that, right? You know, get get the big things, the bookends, uh, because that's that's nothing. Nothing goes well by doing that. Um, the the other thing that I would say is, you know, there there is opportunities in every crisis. There is there is anger in every crisis. There is in this case there's there's death. There there are all kinds of terrible things that are very easy for all of us to list, but there are just as many, if not more, opportunities for us, and they could be as simple as engaging with your neighbor. I'll, I will admit to you all that I have probably talked to my neighbors more in the last 30 days than I had in the past two years because I'm sitting out in my front yard more. You know, I'm, I'm in my back porch more. I see them going by. You know, so, you, you know, you're, you're leaning into your neighbor. There's opportunities in, in business. There's opportunities in the ministry. There are things that we never thought about before that, that now we have thought about and now we can do. There's opportunities to lean into people. Um, because they're in a time, a tumultuous time, they've lost their job or, or, or they're having a health struggle. There's an opportunity for us, you know, as their neighbors to lean into them personally, that maybe we wouldn't have had that opportunity when, when times were, were really, really good. Uh, so I, I think that there's opportunities that abound and it's, you know, it's incumbent upon, you know, each one of us to, to find those opportunities and, and to lean into them the best we can. That's, that's a great word. And, you know, as we close here in prayer, um, I, I just want to say a couple things. First of all, Next week, this is the second in a series of four webinars. Next week, we're gonna talk about use of technology and data in a pandemic. Um, and we have uh, a secured David Kinneman, who is the CEO of Barna, Barna Research. And so we're gonna talk about some amazing tools that the church and even the business community can use. Um, so join us next Thursday, same bat time, same bat channel, uh, Thursday at 11.30. And then finally, our last uh, seminar on May the 21st is gonna be uh, basically, how, the art of neighboring, just what we've been talking about. I mean, Jesus said to love our neighbors, but most of us don't even know our neighbors. And so how can we do that effectively? How can we really create a deep sense of community at a local level? Uh, and, and we have a, an expert on that that's going to talk about that. So we're very pleased about that. Um, and I just want to say to, to uh, before we close in prayer that... Um, I have observed elected officials. I, I have no intention of being one, but we want us, we're committed as an organization seeing good government happen. Um, and there's, there's a time and a place for everything Ecclesiastes 3 says, but this is a time where we, we need to respect and pray for and uphold our leaders. And look, there's going to be a time for accountability and replacement, and I'll be leading the way on that, as you know, from my past. Uh, but this is not the time for that. This is the time for support. Uh, and to believe God and, and, and to pray for these men and women who are trying to do. I, I think that there are very few people that are acting in good faith. There are some states that have crazy governors and, and mayors, but in Florida, we are very blessed to have people acting in good faith and are really, I think, doing the best job they can do. Put yourself in their shoes and ask, what would you do differently that would be very different? It, this is a tough place that they're in. So, uh, uh, we are commanded by scripture, Kevin, to, to pray. And so we, let's pray for the mayor, the chancellor, and the house speaker here, if we could. As we go. We're privileged to do that. We respect you, gentlemen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to one more time receive information, uh, to get clarity, uh, to be able to recognize those who are serving us in the civic arena, uh, the pressures that they have, the decisions they have to make, and Lord, from Speaker Designate Sprouls to Mayor Mutz to our Chancellor of Education, Eric Hall, we just pray for these men as we would all of our elected and appointed officials from the president and our Congress federally to all of the state uh, leadership as well. We ask, Lord, that if there was ever a time that we needed wisdom from above, this is one of those times. So, uh, Lord, we seek you. Our eyes are turning to you. Uh, we appreciate all the dedicated doctors and nurses and those in the medical profession who have the data and the ability to interpret it, helping us make decisions. We appreciate all the frontline people, 
Uh, Lord, there's so many that have just been activated from farmers and truck drivers, as been mentioned, uh, to those who are just working in grocery stores, how important they've suddenly become. And so, Lord, we just lift up all these people that you would strengthen them. But Lord, our eyes are upon you. We, we need you. These are the moments we realize just how limited we are as human beings. There are a lot of things we have ingenuity and a lot of things that our cleverness and our wittiness can press through. But there are other moments like a virus that causes us to realize that we are limited. And so we look to you and we cry out to you. And Lord, as we are making all these other adjustments with regards to our lives and social distancing and all of the questions that surround it, Lord, I pray right now that we'd all take this moment to make sure our priorities are right with you. And that this would be a moment that we would look to you and seek you and realize that when these moments come, we need you desperately. So, Lord, we just pray that we would be mindful of that. Bless these men and others as they now go and make great decisions. Lord, we appreciate them. Bless them, strengthen them, help them to hear the encouraging voices and not all the others that oftentimes want to tear them down. And Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity again. Bless John and his leadership as well with Florida family. And Lord, may your name be made great through it all, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being a part. And we are adjourned until next week at the same time. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you very much.